Hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. This webinar is entitled Insights into Data Science for Social Impact, Learnings from the Inclusive Growth and Recovery Challenge. I'm Ginger Zielinski, Chief, Chief Strategy Officer at data.org. And again, thank you so much for joining us. Our conversation today will hover around key findings from the Inclusive Growth and Recovery Challenge. The challenge sought to uncover innovative social impact organizations harnessing the power of data science to achieve their mission. We awarded $10 million in grants and technical assistance to eight organizations plus a ninth in partnership with the Paul Ramsey Foundation. The challenge received over 1,260 applications from 109 countries across a broad diversity of organizations, interventions, sustainable development goals, and data science applications. I want to pause and thank you so much to our founding partners, the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, as well as the Rockefeller Foundation, and of course, our technical partner, Datakind, and Afu Bruce, who uh, you'll be able to hear from today. To review this, plethora of applications in partnership with Datakind, we engaged close to 400 judges from 49 countries and engaged in over 3000 hours of technical review. I can tell you honestly that we were astonished by the innovation, power and potential of the applications in which we were able to review. Today, we'll talk about the application process. We'll hear from one of our challenge awardees and we'll seek to uncover how best to support this growing and dynamic community of data science professionals achieving social impact. I'd like to first start by uh, giving the floor over to my colleagues to introduce themselves and Afua will start with you. Thanks so much, Ginger. Um, as Ginger briefly mentioned before, my name is Afua Bruce and I'm the Chief Program Officer at Datakind. Um, that means that I have the privilege of overseeing Datakind's execution of all of our programmatic offerings, whether it's from individual projects with specific organizations to week-long, um, weekend-long data dive events where we dive in on problems really quickly, um, or um, challenge support such as we did for this challenge. It's also a privilege to be able to um, help work with all of our volunteers. We have thousands of volunteers across the world in chapters in the US, in Singapore, in India, and in the UK. Datakind was able to serve as the technical partner for this challenge, which means that we helped craft an application that really allowed organizations to talk about their mission and about how data science might advance that mission. We recognize how much goes into applying for these challenges and wanted to make sure that we could give every application, um, all nearly 1300 applications, the uh, proper amount of consideration. So we activated our volunteer community. And in the short amount of time, in just four weeks, we were able to have about 400 volunteers uh, donate nearly 2,000 hours to ensure all applications were reviewed multiple times by multiple people from around the world. Um, to support uh, applicants throughout the process, we also delivered a number of webinars, which you can actually see um, still on the website. Um, these uh, webinars covered things such as the art of the possible, what's uh, showcasing what data science solutions and inclusive gr growth and recovery look like, um, a scoping 101 session where we help people think about how to identify your data scienceable problem, and a data 101 session where we looked at um, discussing open source data, overlook data, and the ethics of data. We then did another more detailed uh, review of applications for their data science and social good for potential. So Datakind has been applying data science um, and machine learning in the social sector for nearly a decade. We have a lot of expertise in how we can really apply data science to advance missions. And so we were able to facilitate a review of these applications uh, to look at really how this data science could be used, how the projects also could uh, really center and involve the humans that are ultimately affected and served by uh, the data science work in the actual work of, of doing the project. It's uh, such a pleasure to be involved with the challenge overall and uh, thanks for the invite today, Ginger. Yeah, I look forward to digging in further. Thomas, over to you. Hi everyone. Um, so this is Thomas uh, from BASE, which is a Swiss not-for-profit organization. 
Um, and we are a specialist partner of the United Nations Environment. We were founded in 2001, and we develop financial mechanisms that help to unlock investments in energy efficiency, renewable energy, and climate change solutions. And within this challenge, the data.org challenge, we partner with EMPA, um, represented by Tess, who will present himself right after, to tackle a major issue, which is that um, India's 20% of India's production of fruit and vegetable goes to waste. It's worth $10 billion um, per year. And this is due to a lack of cold storage. So to do this, we are designing an open access and data science driven mobile application that enables farmers to optimize the management of their produce and their farm. And uh, this, and also to access sustainable cooling. And the cooling and the app are made inclusive and accessible through a pay-per-use business model, which we call cooling as a service, and which essentially avoids any upfront investment and has the provider operating and owning the equipment, which also incentivizes the use of the more energy efficient um, cooling system, which despite being more expensive upfront, actually costs less over the lifetime of the equipment. So to do this, we are partnering also with local entrepreneurs uh, in India. We're targeting 200 to 500 farmers to actually pilot this. And we are aiming to break the cycle of poverty while improving uh, food security and reduce the impact on climate change of agriculture. Um, and I'll also give the word to Tess to give a bit more detail on how exactly we use the data within this application, um, because that's an important part. And we are really happy to be here to share our experience in general as uh, participants and as going through this whole challenge. Thank you so much. This over to you. Thanks, Ginger. So it's my pleasure also to be here and to give a short overview of what we actually do. So I'm working at AMPA. This is the Swiss Federal Labs, so also based in Switzerland. And I'm uh, leading there a group. And what we actually try to do is we try to save food wherever we can and understand what are the reasons for food loss and how we can avoid that. And how do we do that? Well, we use data, of course. So we try to take all the data which is available and upcycle that into ready-made information for stakeholders to use, that they don't have to deal with a big pile of data, but they have a ready-made solution for that. So this is also why we, in this project, partnered up with BASE, because we can have the best solution to try to save food by cooling. But in order to implement that, especially smallholder farmers need to have um, a financial, financially uh, viable solution for that. So that's how this partnership actually came to play. And what we want to do in this project is to democratize all the data and all the data science to make uh, to help farmers benefit from that nowadays this is still not possible so how do we do that we create machine learning solutions in order for example to um, identify which smallholder farmers we could target best taking into account um, the inclusive nature of this problem and also to for example help to try to save food good thanks ginger you. Thank you so much. And thank you all of you for joining us today. Uh, the way in which we'll structure our conversations is uh, we'll spend about the next half hour or so. Um, I'll, I'll be your moderator today and uh, providing the questions and probably also a little bit of unsolicited commentary. And then uh, we'll want to make sure that we take the time to open it up for questions from all of you that have been able to join us today. So please do keep those keep those questions coming and we'll do our best to answer just as many as we possibly can. Afua, I'd like to start with you. One thing that I was surprised by as we were reviewing these applications together was the diversity of, of organizations that applied, that there was a, a group of organizations that were, were less than $250,000 in revenue all the way up to your most sophisticated social, international social impact organizations. And just the breadth of diversity of organization type was something that was um, both heartening to us because we saw that so many people were thinking about uh, how to apply data science to their specific problems that they sought to solve, um, and just the opportunity. Uh, it was just seemed like such fertile ground. I'm curious in, 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 from your perspective, what was something that really surprised you in reviewing the application pool? 
Yeah, great question. Thanks, Ginger. I um, I feel like we learned so much from this challenge. I'm going to flip your question a little bit and go from a little bit of what surprised me to some of what this challenge confirmed with me. Um, as I mentioned, DataKind has been um, working with uh, data science in the social sector, including a number of organizations tackling um, economic challenges, such as inclusive growth and recovery, uh, for many years. And so seeing the volume of organizations who submitted applications to this challenge and I can tell you, having read a number of these applications myself, um, there was just a incredible amount of strong applications. It really confirmed that there is a desire to apply data science for social good in the sector and that a lot of different organizations, to your point, Ginger, are thinking about it. Different organizations that differ by size, that differ by location, that differ by challenge they're focusing on are thinking about how can we apply data science for social good. So it's just exciting to see that. Um, the challenge also confirmed that partnerships are really key to make to success in this space and that partnerships really do allow for a lot of different types of expertise, whether it's data science expertise, um, a particular issue um, or domain expertise, government and regulation expertise, but partnerships really allow for a lot of different types of expertise to come together to support communities, which is ultimately what this work is all about. Um, being data scientists um, and people who generally like making uh, data-driven decisions at DataKind, we had to do a bit of data analysis on the applications we receive themselves. So we had a team of some of our expert volunteers do a bit of um, an NLP or natural language uh, processing analysis of the applications themselves. And while we definitely expected to see the phrase machine learning quite a bit, you expect that with a data science challenge. Um, it was also interesting to me to see that with the written uh, and the amount of written information that NGOs deal with, that we also saw natural language processing appear repeatedly um, as a frequently mentioned technique that organizations wanted to use. It was also really exciting to see um, deep uh, learning and related uh, modeling to deep learning mentioned in about 7% of the applicants, actually. Um, these advanced methods, I think, really provide um, really prove rather that the there are parts of the social sector who see a need for and are actively examining how to apply some of the most advanced technical uh, techniques in the social sector. I think sometimes there um, is an idea that maybe the social sector is ready for this or isn't thinking about it, but really uh, seeing about 7% of these applications talk about these more advanced techniques says that the need is there and that people are actively thinking about it. And then as far as topics were concerned, I was really excited to see the many ways that people are thinking about how do we really advance inclusive growth and recovery. So if, um, the applications allowed people to mark um, any number of sustainable development goals that they were um, uh, trying to solve with their application and with the work that they were proposing through this process. Um, the SDGs of industry and innovation and infrastructure, sustainable cities and communities, good health and well-being were cited by more than 60% of um, participants. Um, you might ex expect that with inclusive uh, growth and recovery being in the title. But I was also really interested in, um, and maybe a bit surprised to see that um, the uh, peace and justice and strong institutions, as well as the responsible consumption and production and life on land, all um, being cited by about 25% of applications. It's really exciting to see that um, there are so many different ways that the social sector can come together to really make a difference in the inclusive growth and recovery. Um, just the diversity of techniques being applied, the diversity of ways of thinking about framing this challenge, and the diversity of locations and communities that are both doing this work and being served by this work, um, all coming together to really solve um, really what's one of the most important uh, topics and most uh, difficult challenges at this time. Thank you, Afua. Um, I appreciate your data-driven answer. Um, and, and for those of you that are interested in some of the stats and analysis that Afua uh, did mention, you'll notice that the uh, challenge report is linked in the chat and it outlines uh, both responses by SDGs as well as budget size and um, data science application and really uh, punches and, and iterates um, exactly the points that Afua, Afua outlined for us. Thank you again. One thread of um, that you mentioned was uh, about the power of partnerships. And so uh, Thomas and Thys, I'd love to um, 
uh, spend some time learning from you about how you use the challenge um, and how the challenge supported uh, the, the partnership between BASE and EMPA. Sure, I mean, for us, this has been very interesting um, because the partnership has been not only essential because of the complementary skill sets, but also because it helped us to actually gain new perspectives to tackle the same problem. Um, and it has been also really successful because we have been quite transparent at the beginning in um, acknowledging our strengths and weaknesses, which also meant that we were able to identify um, and address potential gaps or challenges and really work together as one, one broad team. And even now that the project has started, we still feel this in that um, there's now two teams, uh, Empath Team Based Team, it's really one, one big project team and, and the team members uh, interact directly um, on, to work on the different elements. So, so this is actually quite nice. Um, and I think this has been one of the things that also the whole challenge has pushed us to do, is to look how can we go beyond what we know? How can we look beyond our own expertise? We on our, within base, we are, okay, we are experts in designing financial mechanisms to unlock investment in climate change solutions, but we, and we had been thinking about um, using data science or digitalization, but um, it was not until we actually had this opportunity with this challenge that we looked into really more concrete ways of doing so, and that we had to reach out, reach out to partners that could complement um, us in this. And that's how we started this partnership with, with EMPA. I'm sure Tess wants to, to complement this as well. Yeah, indeed. I mean, you nicely set up this ground structure to uh, force us to work together, to let us show we need each other and we need the partners on the ground. So this was laid out from the start, from the first call we had with you, the exploratory call, before we even submitted the first project. And this was really nice. It was really like you saying to us, we need a solution and it has to work. So make sure you gather all the people around to make it work, which we then did. And this was really very nice because now this is rolling and we need each other and we see it more clearly every day. And just to complement again, in addition to the partnership between uh, AMP and BASE, there's also the many partnerships, um, for instance, between the, with the local, uh, essentially the, lo the people on the ground, right? So in our case, it are uh, cooling service providers um, and it are farmers. And without strong partnerships there, which also means that trust has to be built and relationships have to be built, um, it's not really possible to, to implement such a solution. And it also means that in the end, we are not really driving the innovation, they are driving the innovation. We are in, we are in the background um, to push the state of the art technology to where it has to be, but it's really developed together with the local partners. So that's a big component as well. Uh, your answer really created the opportunity for us to have an hour just talking <laughs> about partnerships and the essentiality as we think about using data science um, to achieve social impact. And a, a couple of, of threads that coming out of the report that I want to highlight. One is that um, inclusive growth and recovery is, is uh, in no way in a vacuum that it's actually absolutely interconnected with how we think about uh, climate change, how we think about health and education. And that was um, something that was just so heartening for us as we think about the power of data science um, to bring new insights and to architect new and innovative ways of delivering solutions, power of thinking outside of your own core competency and your own expertise and partnering across, for example, EMPA, who's focusing um, on food and food waste and BASE, who's focusing on climate change. And together, we can come up with a solution that helps farmers and it also helps our, our climate. And so that your example is just um, embodies, I think, what was so heartening for us and, and, and what, what the power is um, to actually achieve a new scale of impact. Um, I also just wanna highlight something that came along when we were preparing for this conversation, and I think it's just worth repeating, um, is the power of humility, uh, that you can bring your own expertise, and you can, might even be able to bring your own data, 
uh, but but the but where the where truly data science to achieve social impact has power is when we bring that interdisciplinary approach to the work that we collectively seek to engage in. And again, you all just embody that. Hey, this is what I'm great at, and I'm also excited and willing and ready to learn from um, partners who bring a, a complementary skill set, complementary data, and, and complementary approaches. I just want to push a little bit further on partnerships before we move on, because I want to make sure that we are continually learning and sharing um, out from both you and the and the whole pool of applicants. I'm wondering, Thomas and Sis, if you would have any recommendations about, you know, if there's an organization and they really want to access or really see this interconnection from, say, food to climate change or um, food to inclusive growth. How, how do they start? How do they forge? Um, what, what, what recommendations would you have about how to, how to get started in building that type of partnership that you all demonstrate? Yeah, that's a great question as well. And actually at base, uh, we are in the situation in which we are not experts in data science in itself, but we, we see the potential, the unused potential of this data. Um, and uh, what, what we did is basically look at the whole value chain of, of within our solutions um, and the challenges that these solutions are trying to tackle and to try to find at which points information is generated and where this information can actually be used and how this can be done in, in a manner that is um, at, at a low cost, low transactional cost, so in an automated way. Um, and that's where many ideas uh, come, but then typically these are loose, loose ideas uh, that don't really necessarily come to a concrete use case. Um, and this is also where uh, seeking entities that might be in a similar space, but working from a different angle can suddenly uh, basically make the, the tie the knots, right? And, and suddenly generate these, these new ideas that become concrete impactful case, case uses. And then to add on that, if I may, so what's also very important is to find common ground. Um, so BASE and, and AMPA, we both were aware there was a lot of data available in both fields. We were not tapping into the, the full potential there. This brought us together to see that there is a, a big potential. And then the second advice I would give is really to connect to your partner and make sure you're rapid or fast on the same pace and page and you can work together. So the people are extremely important in partnerships, which we see with the people on the ground, which we work with which we see now with us and base, and this runs very smoothly, which is good. It's not always the case. So find your good partner, which, which you want to collaborate with for a longer time. And if it's not the right match, then it's better to step out. Yes, you cannot, you, oh, go ahead, Thomas. I just want to compliment again that it doesn't necessarily have to be that there's a concrete opportunity to collaborate from the first moment, mm -hmm. like when EMPA and base started working together, it was, on a relatively broad conversation. And it's only some months later that this opportunity, the challenge actually came to, to, to exist, that so we saw it. And that's where the effort we had already put into knowing each other and building a relationship. Um, it, it, it was this preparation work and then suddenly this happened and it was possible to leverage this. So if we had needed to build the relationship when the challenge came in, it would probably have taken too much time to actually generate the quality um, in the proposal. Thank you for um, sharing both that experiences and, and, and insight. Uh, you know, our role at data.org is to serve as a catalyst for these types of partnerships to serve as that connective tissue. Um, and so in addition to the amazing uh, grantees that we are able to engage, we are absolutely committed to building a community. Um, from all of your perspective, this is a question for all of you. Uh, how do you think it that we should all be working together as a global community? What, where are there opportunities to strengthen uh, the cohort, uh, strengthen the connective tissue, and um, and build shared learning, build shared skills? Um, and Afu, I'll kick it to you first. Uh, sure. Thanks, Ginger. Um, so when when I think about this question, um, I think about one of the ways Datakind thinks of 
what is needed um, to do uh, data science for social impact and to do it well. And so we often talk about what we've identified as the, the six components for success here. And so that includes for us um, a smart problem statement, uh, having data sets available, having data scientists available, having funders available, having subject matter experts available, and um, of course the social actor who at the end of the day would use whatever solutions that's there. And so I think even when we take a look at uh, the applications from this challenge, I think it really showed that different organizations need different um, components, right? So some of the applications really wanted support and funding, um, some of the, just to execute work that they'd already envisioned. Some of the applications uh, wanted support in finding and cleaning um, or creating data sets. Some just needed to know how do I find uh, more or different or any data scientist at all to help me execute on this. And so when I think, you know, what's the, what are the gaps there? I think it's really in building these connections. Um, so some of the work that you're doing at uh, data.org, Ginger, to make some of these connections happen. I think some of the work that DataKind is doing to uh, make some of the connections, especially between data scientists and defining problem statements um, and then executing on the projects themselves with all of these components together is, is really important and um, is a gap that we still see in the space. Please go ahead, Tess. Yeah, and I wanted to add there for us, it's very important to convince ourselves and to convince people which we work with and also people um, which we're connected to, to have a success story. So we have to show it works. And if this, if we can prove this, then it just gets the ball rolling in our organization, but also uh, to show others what is possible. So that's an important aspect, which we try, I mean, which we will achieve in this challenge as well to be no targeted. Pressure, use. Sis. No, no pressure, no, no. It's, not, <laughs> it's not a pressure. I mean, for us, it's, it's a privilege to be able to do that. So, but for us, it's, it's, I mean, we, we target a few success stories, a few wins we, we want to do in order to see where can we fit data science in the best way. So what's the best for us? Because we don't put all eggs in one basket. We have different strategies to see where we can make the most out of this for the problem we're tackling now. Thomas, I think. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more with both of you. Um, the, the grant funding itself is of course very valuable because, um, these kind of projects are faced with a certain risk that the private sector might not be willing or able to take, especially uh, if we're talking about developing countries and 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 um, so hard to heat to reach markets and like smallholder farmers in this case. Um, and this kind of funding helps to pilot these solutions to show that they're viable and then scale them up. Um, but in addition to it to this, um, the actual technical support that we are receiving. Um, and will be receiving from data.org, from, from, from MasterCard, from um, DataKind, is something that is extremely valuable because we essentially have world-class experts joining us, joining the team to work together with us. Um, and that is on the one hand very valuable, but also it enables us as an organization to learn from that and to build capacity internally, which means that not only it strengthens our own team for this project, but also our team will then be, um, will, will continue, this will have an impact beyond the project because then that means our team has, in this case, more capacity and knowledge to actually design and implement other projects that might leverage data science um, in environmental and social challenges. So in that sense, when you say you see data.org or the challenge as a catalyzer, that's also really the way I see it because it's not only about, about the money, it's really about the whole technical assistance be, behind this. Um, yeah, I think that, I think again, kind of, emulsifying some advice that you all provided through your answers is um, to teams who are trying to get started, get started, right? Like just just, just jump in, try to do the work, try, define the problem statement. And again, um, I think take a look at the work of the, the webinar that DataKind provided in terms of how to really um, architect your data science problem and the proposed solution. And it's worth your energy it's worth the, the frustration that you might feel um, and it's worth your persistence because the power of what is possible is actually transformative um, if we can break through um, you know, some, of the, some of the maybe operational sludge that we've all felt. Um, it would be uh, disingenuous if I didn't take a moment and um, 
be uh, tur turn the spotlight a little bit on our work and how we could get better. So I wanted to have a, a two part question about gaps. Um, and, and, and this is parlaying into um, a, a question from one of our participants as well. But one, I would like to first start with, um, how could, how could we have done this challenge better? You know, are there, are there opportunities for us to improve? Are there opportunities for the philanthropic community overall and how they uh, launch challenges? Um, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort to respond, right? And so if there are 1,260 uh, organizations and partnerships that responded, um, you know, the vast, the, you know, 99% more than that w did not receive funding. So I'm just curious, um, specifically from, from you, Thomas, and this, and then, and then to Afua, you know, what could we have done better? One of the things I would imagine is to actually reward, um, to some extent, the, all the work that has been done by all these other institutions. And it doesn't mean fund everyone because it's, not possible, uh, I wish it were, um, but it could mean, for instance, enabling, so there's so many ideas that have been created by all of these institutions and groups, um, enabling these to then connect with each other, um, maybe through matchmaking events or platforms or, or at least being able to share lessons learned and potentially identify other partners um, within this group of institutions and organizations who are clearly interested in the same objective, which is using data science for social impact and which have been, which did put a lot of time and effort into designing solutions. So essentially making sure these ideas don't get lost and don't get back in a drawer, because probably there's a bit, there's a lot of potential for these. And, and maybe what has, um, what was the missing piece could have been in some cases using this power of interdisciplinary partnerships. So maybe finding a way to actually promote these, um, for example, identifying two ideas of two institutions that might have nothing to do with each other, and then recommending these to connect and to probably create a, a new idea that comes out of this and could go into a second round of funding and might be stronger together than, than alone. That's just one idea on my side. Yeah, actually, I, I fully agree with that. So you have already now got the ball rolling with 1,200 consortia, which is huge. And they they have been thinking and they have been seeing if data science might be good for them or not. So they already are a step further. Now they cannot give up. So maybe if they can team up in the meanwhile for a next round, maybe not data.org, but maybe somewhere else, this could uh, accelerate accelerate uh, the use of data science in their in their organizations. But apart from that, I mean, I should say how the challenge was constructed was actually really, really good in the sense that we, um, we could have the opportunity to talk with your experts, which helped us a lot. So this is not always the case. Often it just a call is out and you have to submit something. And we had done this interview, which is also really nice. So with respect to that, I should say that's I mean, there is less, not so much to improve there. It's only the afterwards. So what we have now, the status where we are now, how to try to make the most of all the people that uh, that did not make it. And Afua, for you, I'm going to I'm going to shift the question just a little bit. Um, and this is uh, specifically from a, a colleague um, in the chat. So so thank you um, for this question, but. Um, really interested um, in kind of in the in the umbrella of gaps um, in the field uh, what skills and support do you think need to be in place for um, organizations and partnerships to uh, to have um, even better stronger not just applications but interventions um, and and Afua given your experience and expertise not just only in reviewing the challenge, but your work at Datakind and, and the scoping work that you do. I'm, we're just curious, you know, are there certain gaps that are, are trends that um, organizations should really invest in overcoming? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, the the word you one of the words you just used in your teeing up that question scoping. I think that is something that's incredibly important. What um, what we see at DataKind over and over and over again is that some of what makes the most successful projects uh, at the end of the process is really how we began the process and how we began the projects. And so that means do organizations know how to define a problem statement in a way that they are truly thinking of, you know, what are their the biggest problems? What are the wicked problems that keep them up at night? Um, what then are the tools that need to be in place, the data that needs to be in place to really help uh, support that problem? Well, support the solution to that problem specifically. Um, and then from there, how do you actually scope a project? If the project is too big or too small, you're not going to be able to get the right talent to actually to be in place to actually make a difference for the organization. And um, I think this is something that a lot of organizations struggle with. It's a, it's, um, a skill set that takes a lot of time. Um, it's a skill that, um, and a step in the process really that people often want to rush through to get to you know the real coding or to the real work or to the real people. But you really do have to take a lot of time to be intentional about that problem statement definition and about the scoping process. Uh, I think we actually saw this a lot in the challenge as well. Um, some of the well-attended uh, webinars that we had, the most well-attended were about problem statements and about um, the scoping process. And so I think um, how we can continue to develop that skill set across the six um, that um, sector, how we go to people who are experts in that, um, I think is really, um, is really important. I think uh, that on a related level is just, um, just continuing to get people excited to do this work and how you build that matching between where are the data scientists, where are the organizations that need the work um, done, and who is actually, again, really bringing in that community piece. How do you make sure that what you're developing is respectful of communities, is giving um, power back to communities, and really empowering the communities um, that are being served and should have some type of ownership over the uh, ultimate solution? Can I quickly jump in, Shinjir? Uh, because I fully agree, and, and that's really think before you act or before you write is really a very important step here. And these webinars, I could recommend them to anybody. I watched some of them twice because it's so good, well structured, and, and you learn a lot from that. You, it gets you thinking. So that was really for us a big help in also help scoping the, pro the project. We already had experience. We got already projects approved and so on. This added an additional step, an additional quality level, which we could now achieve. So really, very, that was really very good uh, experience from our side. So just in terms of more practical advice coming from, um, from, from our colleagues today, there is um, a Scoping 101 webinar that is recorded on the data.org website. And it's exactly the webinar that FIS is talking about, which actually walks you through step-by-step step how to appropriately scope your data science problem. And it's led by Afua and her colleagues. So um, if you're thinking, hey, I've got something and I just need to figure out how to structure it and, and need a little bit of help in it, making sure that you're asking the right questions, uh, please do um, take a look. And uh, Nicole or Perry, if you would be so kind as to pop that into the chat. So it's a resource that is really, we're going to engage in some behavioral economics and nudge you um, towards, that, towards that webinar as well, because it really is just so beneficial um, not just for how to architect the, and operationalize your solution, but also how to bring partners along, right? So if you can scope appropriately and you can extreme and articulate, articulate clearly the role of different partners through that process, you're also building trust. And, um, we cannot underestimate the power of trust between partnerships as we, as we, um, engage in these endeavors. Um, Apua, I want to turn Ginger, back to you. May, yes. May, may I add something here? Um, because oh, I, I think it touches very well on the point of what, what's the role of, of challenges? Why do we need challenges? Um, and uh, in our case, we had been thinking for quite a while, how can we integrate data science into our solutions? How can we do this? And, and this requires time and dedication of time. And what this challenge did uh, was also setting a framework that would enable us to not only dedicate that time, but do this with a certain amount of discipline because there were some requirements and there was a whole process involved and there were some guiding questions as well. That's how a challenge is typically set up. There's some guided questions. So it helps you to think about questions that you might otherwise not be thinking about. Um, and that's really what helped us to, to generate essentially this, um, this use case and that put 
um, that put these all these ideas into action. Um, so that's uh, very, very useful. I think not only the webinars, but just the whole structure of the challenge. Uh, thank you, Thomas. And, and um, you know, as you were talking, um, I was also thinking about, you know, the power of scoping and the necessity to be both um, adaptable uh, in, in terms of what you learn and the context in which you're operating. Um, and given uh, your partnerships with on the ground entities and, on, and farmers within rural India, um, it would be tone deaf of me completely not to honor the challenging situation that uh, India finds themselves in as they um, continue to battle the global pandemic um, and you know the power of data in terms of what we know and what we don't um, is front and center in all of our lives um, all of the time right now. And uh, I'm curious um, how through as we were thinking about inclusive growth and response and recovery, the world was changing under our feet and how uh, you were able to continue to adapt as a partnership in, in building the solution and how you're really continuing to do so um, throughout the, the life of the challenge. I, I would very much appreciate your perspective and thoughts on that. So how we are continuing to implement this project is within, within the current the wake situation. of COVID and within a, a changing yeah. environment and with changing needs. Yes, I mean it is more challenging. We have normally when we implement these kind of projects, we we go we go to the to the on the ground. We meet people. We we get to know the actual environment. Um, we we were able to conduct interviews, read the new the local newspaper to understand what's happening. And this is right now not possible. But this is also why we are really um, building these strong relationships with the entities on the ground. And we're also conducting interviews with um, renowned experts in the country uh, who are working with the government or working for different NGOs, associations, or um, in agricultural entities. Um, and this also gives us a lot of insights. So that's the way we have been dealing with this so far. Um, we are having, we are currently conducting some underground activities, for example, surveys or, or, or these um, types of activities, which would be much easier if the situation were like it was two years ago. Um, but now um, the people we work with are trying uh, some digital ways as well for the surveys or just limiting the amount of travel that has to be done to reach similar goals. And just to add, it's, it's again about partnerships. So this uh, situation forced us to rely on partnerships to be our eyes and ears more on the ground than we could be ourselves. And this works actually fine. You just have to invest more into partnerships, which we did invest a lot of time into, but it, there's a, a great added value. Actually, it makes, it has even a positive impact in the sense that it, it makes that we actually work even closer together because we have to work with them more closer than before. And Afua, I'm just curious how your your work has changed and your scoping work and your partnerships and your volunteer network, um, you know, as we all collectively, both collectively and very individually um, seek to seek to help um, in some way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, you know, a, a year and a half ago, DataCan was doing a lot of uh, scoping activities and data science support in, in person. Uh, not really doing them in person anymore and have sh shifted to uh, obviously a virtual way of working, which really uh, means getting really clear as to how to structure conversations so that you can still have that good dialogue again as to how do we really define problems? How do we really scope problems well? Um, also, it's important um, we've seen to continue to find more and more ways for all of those different components to play together. And so how can we provide more events um, to really activate our, um, in data case, uh, case, our community of data science expert volunteers? Um, 400, nearly 400 people in four weeks to donate, you know, 3,000 hours is 
not an um, insignificant feat. And it really shows, I think, the number of people who are willing to dive in but need that overall structure to be there. Again, the number of um, applications for this challenge really show the number of organizations across the world who are actively thinking about how can we use data science more effectively and to really advance the mission and to really advance organizations being able to deliver for the communities in which they support. And so um, think about just always thinking through how do we again continue to center the people who we're serving? How do we make sure that we are inclusive um, in the volunteers where our volunteers come from? the projects that we um, the projects that we find and um, to some of the points that have been made earlier just how do we take good work that is in place and how do we support that work even more create those matches where um, needed and really tell that story of what's going on and what can be done in ways that resonate with um, all sorts of people yeah actually i want to build upon um, one of the last uh, statements that you made is the power of storytelling um, and I think what we uncovered is that, you know, data science to better tell the stories and the, and the, the context and the, the complexity um, in which some of these problems exist um, has been um, extremely eye-opening, right? The, the, um, the, the power for, of data science to be applied towards these complex problems is different than applying data science just to make sure that you know, I bite the right turtleneck um, before I put my phone down at night, right? Like we're, there, there is a structural components. And so um, I'm just curious um, how this and Thomas, you are thinking about the work that you're doing and how it relates to the stories you seek to tell. Um, not on, in, in addition to the, the, the change you seek to make, um, how, how that's driving some of your work in thinking about um, scale and expansion. Maybe that's an interesting one for actually test to tackle because uh, I mean, with the physics-based modeling, it's something you've been doing for for some time, and this is a really concrete way to include it in a in a broader story, right? So. Um, yeah. So, I mean, how should I scope it? So, what what we the story we are trying to. To tell it is a success story also in the sense that we want to um, we want to help to save food and we have now a solution which is easily implementable let's say for larger entities companies or whatever but it's not really designed to help smallholder farmers because it's more attractive to always go the other way and to go to the entity which has maybe a little bit more money and power to push it through to scale it up so this upscaling is, we have to really design for it. It's much more difficult if you're dealing with smallholder farmers. But in this project, we're setting up a pilot to get the success story out, to show that it works, and then to diversify and try to use it also for, for other in other countries and, on, and with other stakeholders as well. And also uh, on our side, uh, the we had been working previously already on this business model, cooling as a service, but we had been implementing it mainly in other sectors, um, for instance, commercial air conditioning, industrial refrigeration, um, and now applying it in this specific sector of agricultural cold storage um, is a very powerful way to also show that this is actually not just about um, reducing the energy of cooling systems or, or of any type of system, but it's really a lot about generating this social impact and that, um, social and environmental impacts can really be tackled very often with, with one solution or at least with, with a similar approach. Uh, and to yeah. add that, if I, if I may, uh, Ginger, so Please. to add that, it was astonishing to see when we were doing this and trying to or we are developing this virtual assistant how much is available already for larger entities but completely inaccessible for smallholder farmers so we have to completely design the architecture in a different way that our solution can give them a kind of a, a benefit and that, that's a very nice exercise which is a, exactly what this challenge is about but you have to completely redesign the way all our solutions work in a way Afu, were you going to jump in there? 
Um, I was just going to build on what's already been said. And I think one of the important things as we think about storytelling this work is really just how does it matter to the to the ultimate person who's being um, served or who's a part of this process. Um, I know I get really excited about you know the numbers that appear or what an anomaly detection algorithm looks like and uh, what natural processing, uh, natural language processing algorithms may look like as well. That really excites me, but we can't yeah. <laughs> lose track of why does this all matter, right? We're to your point, we're not just here to make sure people have the best sweater, which um, you know is a worthy goal on its own, um, but really tying the work to why does it actually matter? What impact are we having in people's lives? In the case of this challenge, what new ideas have we come up with? What work are we really advancing to really make a difference in how people are able to, to make a difference in their lives and to really um, advance themselves economically for that inclusive of growth and recovery. I think we can't lose sight of that as we tell the stories of this work. It has to center um, why it ultimately matters. Yes, that's, um, thank you for that. And it's actually a tying theme. So as we think about great scoping and we think about effective partnerships and we wanna make sure that we are redesigning solutions in a different way, um, how, uh, and, and, and if you can provide concrete examples of how do we make sure that we are designing with and not for, right? Because man, does that shiny penny of the natural la language processing uh, model, it's, it's enticing and it's sexy. Um, and a lot of the hard work that's required is about making sure that we are operating in a truly inclusive way. Um, and that, uh, that too requires discipline and trust and authentic partnerships. I, I would be curious um, from each of you how you're working to make sure and what are concrete ways in which our colleagues who are listening in today can really deploy to make sure that um, their work is truly inclusive and in both design and in implementation. Maybe I can start. So it's always, I mean, what, what we try to do also in the team is always try to keep our eyes on the goal. We want to save food. We want to save energy. And if that's the starting point from which all your action follow, then you, you cannot go wrong at least. So then you find a solution, it can be data science. Maybe there is an even quicker fix than you don't, don't have to go to data science. So if you approach a problem like that, it's kind of a fail safe often uh, to avoid uh, diverting too much. So that's what, what we always try to do. We have these goals which we set, which are quantitative, which we try to reach as small uh, as fast as possible. And then, um, yeah, this helps us a lot to keep the, the focus. And it avoids a situation in which we will design a very fancy machine learning model um, that doesn't actually uh, end up saving food. And uh, maybe we could do it with some very simple um, other method and, and reach a better or, or a similar objective. So I think that's that's great to, to, to keep with the, with the goal in mind. Uh, and also it's about consulting um, those who will actually be using this, this tool. So in our case, it's farmers, but are we sure that we're not designing something that they do not need, that they won't need? Or um, the service providers who are offering the cooling systems, they might be selling them now. Do they really want to sell the service instead of selling the asset? And do they really want to have their farmers using this app? And should do they themselves want that app to identify or to optimize a cooling service? So that's what we do a lot. So it's not only conducting interviews with maybe all well, these service providers or with heads of associations who have a micro view of maybe the whole country or of specific states or regions, but also going out and actually asking the farmers. So right now the survey that we're conducting um, aims at about 1000 smallholder farmers where we are actually going one by one and asking a, a number of questions, which informs then our solution, which we want to take into account because otherwise it won't be used. So there's no no use in developing a solution that won't actually be, be used by, by the farmers in the end. And to add there is that we're on we're, we are in very close contact with the people we're designing for. So we have every week several calls with them and we pitch our ideas. We pitch the progress we make on the different uh, types of modeling and data science approaches we're using and also more simpler approaches. And then we see how this flies. And if they have a reluctancy and they're very frank sometimes, which is completely good, honesty is really important here 
then we, we see what works and what doesn't. And then we just be honest and <laughs> kill the things which are not, uh, don't have a future. Let's put it like that. I, I think those are great examples. I don't have much to add there. I'll just talk a little bit about um, some of what you know we we need to kind of think about with uh, data sets specifically, and that is just being really intentional in interrogating the data set. So asking, you know, what bias is already encoded in the data that we might use in an analysis, and if it's uh, significant or just what bias is there, does that mean we need to? reconsider using this data set? Does it mean we need to correct something uh, later on in whatever model we're, um, we are looking at, but just really being intentional about also um, examining your data sets and making sure they're, they're representative um, and appropriate for uh, the problem that you're trying to solve. Just underscoring um, the points that you all made, and, and I just wanna emulsify them because I think they're so important is um, you can get it wrong. Right, like the, and um, it's absolutely essential that you're listening to your collaborators and partners and um, uh, people that you seek to serve to make sure that you can be adaptable. And in fact, getting it wrong is sometimes a very necessary and important step along the way. Um, and uh, Afua, I just uh, plus one your point about testing your models for uh, and your data for bias. I just want to double click in there because, you know, uh, responsible AI is everywhere in the news, right? We really can't click on our LinkedIn feed or our Twitter feed or, uh, you know, media in general without a conversation about responsible AI. But I'm just curious your thoughts, you know, really like the how to. So when you say test your, test your data set for bias, can you just expand a little bit more in, in, in terms of what you mean and, and what are practical ways or practical resources that our colleagues um, who are joining us today can, can learn from? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are a, a number of different resources that are out there. Um, I can probably follow up afterwards because uh, I don't have any of the links uh, on yes. hand right now to Sorry. share. That was, that, was a, <laughs> that was a surprise question. Right, uh, no worries, but you know, I. I think so, um, the, a couple of ways that this might appear. Um, so one is that you might have in your, um, in your data sets uh, something, uh, a particular value that is then directly correlated with something you don't want to actually solve for. And so you may have, um, I think uh, you see this sometimes in uh, benefits data in that um, some eligibility criteria, which is meant to include everyone, um, some of the exclusion criteria then uh, is disproportionately affecting people of color. And so then being really intentional as to, is this the set that we need to use? Is there a different value? Um, you know, zip codes is uh, something that sometimes appears yep. in this way. Uh, so should we be using zip codes? Should we not be using zip codes? Is there something else that we can correct for or add to uh, this zip code data to make sure that our overall goal of delivering a particular benefit is then truly made available to everyone who should legally um, have access to it? Does Got that it. answer your question? Yeah, that's helpful. I think it's a, there's a healthy skepticism. Right, so we're increasingly more and more data will be available to all of us, but asking it, asking the right questions about what you, what it is and what it isn't will also is the mindset that we have to bring to the table. And, and in fact, our interdisciplinary partners, so partnering with um, both data science experts and social policy experts that may understand those biases and how they exist is another extremely important um, step in the equation. So we've got one minute left. Um, speed round. What are you most excited about? What's coming up that you're super excited about in the field of data science and, and, and in your work? I can start. <laughs> I'll say, uh, I'll say more people, more projects, more funding, all coming together to really deliver uh, more impact for communities. And I'll jump in. So I feel the data is there, the data science is there, it's just not there, for example, for smallholder farmers to benefit from fully. And I would say let's explore the power of interdisciplinarity. Wonderful. 
And I will end with a, 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 a huge note of appreciation and thank you. This has been a, a very fast hour for me and a dynamic conversation. Um, again, to all of our participants that joined, thank you so much. And if there are resources that you need, I would encourage you go to the data.org website where um, the, both the uh, report and the Scoping 101 um, webinar is up and ready. And please continue to keep the conversation um, open and uh, accessible and energized. Uh, have a wonderful day and thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Ginger. Thank you.